أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا حبيب الله رب العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعليه تيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين سيما بقية الله العظيم بقية الله خير لكم إن كنتم مؤمنين ولعنة الدائم على أداه مجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Greetings and felicitations upon the birth of uh, our 12th Imam, inshallah. And welcome to our program, uh, which is a series of uh, discussion uh, in, in regards to the birth of the Savior, as the theme of these programs are. Uh, we are really blessed uh, with uh, the presence of Hujjatul Islam Wal Muslimin, Hajai uh, Bahmanpur, uh, who have uh, given us time to be here. It's indeed uh, Eid times two. One is your presence here and also the birth of uh, the 12th Imam as well. Uh, Ajah, thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah and my salams to all the viewers. And uh, I also send my congratulations to everyone for the birth of our Hujja Imam al Mahdi. Uh, thank you very much, Ajah. If our viewers may recall the first program, which or the first episode. Uh, which focus upon the um, aspects of the birth of the Imam uh, and how the conditions of birth were, how the uh, intensity of persecution in regards to the followers of the Ahli Bayt during that period and the signs of the birth of the Imam, uh, particularly in regards to how the mother of the Imam uh, came down from uh, the Roman or the Byzantine uh, area uh, and the dreams that she had uh, and then how the uh, signs of the birth were quite hidden and eventually to the point that the birth itself took place on the 15th of Shaban. Uh, now uh, in today's program we would like to focus in regards to the events that unfolded uh, after the birth uh, of the Imam and also paying attention to uh, some of the unique aspects of the life of the Imam vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis, uh, the Prophet Imam Hussein alayhi salam, other Imams, uh, inshallah. Uh, thank you very much, Agha. I just wanted to uh, look into the aspect of the reports that we find in regards to the birth and people such as the companions and the family members have witnessed and seen the presence of the 12th Imam while the 11th Imam was still alive. Yes. As you mentioned, the taqiyya was very strict at the time. Uh, the imam was under house arrest in Samarra. The very uh, uh, act of bringing the imam, Imam al-Hadi, from Medina to Samarra was putting more surveillance. And we know that Imam al-Askari was only two years old when he came to Samarra with his father. So surveillance was very strict. Imam Ali Salam did not have any opportunity to meet freely with his companions. Even sometimes when he wanted to go to the court and it was, uh, uh, it was uh, sort of uh, uh, surveillance over Imam Al-Hadi, Imam Al-Askari to uh, actually require that they have to to court to go to court every every week, so that to show their presence. And under such a situation, when for example Imam wanted to go to the court, he had asked his Shia not even to signal to him, not say salam to him, because as soon as that happened, they they found out who was the Shia, who was the follower, who was um, uh, affiliated to the Imam, and they arrested them. So under such circumstances, and also with the uh, with the conspiracy that they had to uh, somehow kill the, uh, the, the 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 root in the in the bud actually. Uh, killing the Imam as soon as he was born. So it was very uh, dangerous for uh, the Imam to reveal the birth of Imam al-Mahdi And for that reason, many people, even the Shias, they didn't know that Imam al-Askari had a son. And uh, 
Imam only showed his son to a handful of his companions, the most trusted one, not everyone, of course. And even the family members, because even among the family members, there were people who, were, who had grudges against the Imam. We know even uh, uh, his uncle was going to claim the leadership for himself. So the birth of the Imam should have been concealed from him as well. So you see, even close family members shouldn't have known about the birth of the Imam. Now here there was a dilemma, and the dilemma was this. If the birth was announced and it became a well-known knowledge, then of course the, the government would have found out, the Abbasid Caliph would have uh, somehow wanted to, uh, to, to destroy this house and to kill the Imam. On the other hand, it, if it was concealed completely, then people would not have believed that Imam al-Askari had a son. And then there were, very, there were many claimants after Imam al-Askari. It was not only his uncle, uh, Ja'far al-Kazab, but many other claimants. So it was a very delicate situation. And Imam chose a hand picked of his companions to witness. When they went to his house, for example, he asked the Imam to be, the, 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 the 12th Imam to be brought to their presence so that they see him and they know that Imam had a child. Now, the interesting thing is that we know that the Shia uh, scholarly community, they were very meticulous about finding out who is the Imam after the previous Imam. They wanted proof. They wanted clear signs that who would be an Imam. We have a story of uh, uh, the situation after the uh, the demise of Imam Jafar Sadiq that Abdullah al afta claimed Imam for himself. And because he was the oldest son, majority of Shia believed that he is the Imam. Now, Shia scholars went to his house and said, sorry, uh, with all due respect, we have to ask you some questions to realize whether you are Imam or not. And they asked some questions, he couldn't answer, and they came out and said, this is not Imam until they found Musa ibn Jafar salam. Now, you see, this was the situation. What happened that the whole Shia scholarly community around the world, Islamic world, whether it was in Medina, in Samarra, in Baghdad, in Khurasan, they all had the consensus about Imam al-Mahdi. This is one of the most uh, clever measures that Imam al-Askari took, the companions that he chose to actually convey this message, they were so, tr so much trusted that all scholars were convinced about Imam al-Mahdi, and therefore he, his birth became a, a sort of, uh, uh, a sort of uh, revealed secret. It was a secret, but everyone knew about it. Uh, it seems to be that uh, there was a very hard work uh, went into play by the previous Imams to really prepare the, the, the community, the Shia community, the followers of uh, Shia Islam uh, and the scholars as well, that uh, they could really, um, you know, have that sort of in-depth understanding and marifa in regards to the reality of the essential reality of the Imamat so that even if there be very few reliable reports that will give them that sort of yaqeen, that certainty which they could really carry on if the Imam goes in minor, major or minor occultation. So, uh, so it seems the Imams were already preparing and uh, the du'as of the Imam, for example, we tend to find, as you pointed out to that, that during the prime of the sixth Imam, you know, uh, seventh Imam in regards to the acceptance of the seventh Imam as the Imam. And Imam Jafar Sadiq salam appointed few fake Imams uh, in, his, uh, in his will or in his letter. Uh, so we see the presence of the twelfth Imam in the narrations, in the du'as of the other Imams as well. Well, it was a it was a well known fact among the Shia community that there will be an, a a sort of occultation of the last Imam. It was known, but when this was going to come, 
and how it was going to happen. You know, the situation now seems very easy. But at that time, we have claimants about imama. We have claimants about niyama of the imam. It was not only people claiming that they are imam, claiming that they are naib of the imam as well. And that's why, for example, uh, Uthman ibn Sayyid and Muhammad ibn Uthman and Hussein ibn Ruh, they were actually facing opposition from among very well-known Shia scholars claiming that they were the Nuwa. You know, so you see the situation was very muddy. Now, of course, we sit here and say, yeah, the imams prepared, it was very nice and everyone accepted. It wasn't that easy, especially we, we, if we put that in the context of the fear and, uh, uh, and inquisition and persecution which was going on around. Uh, what you mentioned about preparation, that was very important because, for example, Uthman ibn Sa'id was a deputy of Imam al-Hadi and then a deputy of Imam al-Askari. And then he claiming that he was the deputy of Imam, al, uh, uh, Imam al-Zaman alayhi salam, it made it a bit easy and understandable that there was someone with such a past history being the deputy of these Imams actually issuing the, uh, the edicts of the Imam to the Shia, he was the door to the Imams because Imams were not accessible. Um, Imam al-Askari, Imam al-Hadi, and especially Imam al-Askari, they were not accessible. They were working through these Nawab. So even the network of the Nawab, which uh, uh, were in place since the time of Imam al-Hadi and even Imam al-Jawad, this network helped very much to somehow make the whole uh, secret, which was kept very secretive uh, and underground, make it acceptable to the Shia scholarly community. You know, it was important to convince the scholarly community, not the lay people. Lay people follow the scholars, okay? It was very important to convince the scholars around the world about the birth of the Imam, about his disappearance, about people claiming that they were his deputies, and they accepted it. So now, as you mentioned earlier, Imam was only t Imam Hassan Askari was only two years two years of age when he, when, brought to when he was brought to Samira. So since then, you know, the Imams were under heavy surveillance yes, from yes. that young age of of two That's till true. you know t basically till he was shaheed basically. Yes. You know. So we have these four Nawab, uh, one of them, as you said, who was the deputy or was also companion of Imam al-Hadi and also uh, the companion of Imam Hassan Askari which was apparently the, the very first one, Abu Amir Uthman ibn Sayyid al-Umari. Yes. And uh, he, the period that we find is from 874 AD to 880 AD, so about six years. He was, he witnessed, and he was the one who was taking the letters and whatever request of the Shias to the 12th Imam. And after him, it was his son, apparently, who was considered to be the, uh, the representative. And he was also appointed by the 12th Imam. Uh, as we read his name, Abu Jafar Muhammad ibn Uthman al-Umari, or al-Amiri, apparently, uh, the son of the, uh, uh, of um, Abu Amr. Uthman. 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 And he was from 1880 to 97, uh, I'm sorry, 18, not 18, 880. 880 to uh, 917. So that's a pretty uh, long. much long period, 37 yeah, years. The, the, the second and the third, they had the, the longest period of Niyaba. And the third Naib, of course, Hussein ibn Ruh, was from a very, very credible family. No Bakhti, we, we know him as Hussein ibn Ruh and No Bakhti. And uh, the No Bakhti family, as we know, they were actually the, uh, the representatives of Shia theology in their time. And uh, Ali No Bakht, generally, Ali No Bakht and this Hussein ibn Ruh was from Ali No Bakht. Ali No Bakht generally were like, for example, the uh, the, the, the Bible true creed, that they were actually expressing the Bible true creed of the Shia. And they were actually ministers. They, were, they, were, had, they had very prominent positions 
secretly, you know, it's very interesting. Some of them were secretly uh, giving these creeds to know the extent of their influence in Shia faith. We can look at the book of uh, Awal al-Maqalat of Sheikh Mufid Rahmatullah Alayhi. At the beginning of Awal al-Maqalat is one of the most fantastic books she written in Shia theology, in which he actually mentions article by article the, uh, the articles of Shi'i faith and creed. And he, first of all, he says that I have written this book to show that Shi'i faith is different from Mu'tazili faith because many people were confused about Shi'ism and Mu'tazili. And secondly, he said that there are faults in al Nawakht thinking that I want to clarify here. So wherever I disagree with al Nawakht, I mention it was until the time, it was not before Sheikh Mufid, rahmatullah alayhi. That is about 400, we are talking about one century, more than one century later, that this sort of supremacy of al uh, theological thought on Shi'i faith was somehow broken. Uh, by uh, broken, I don't mean that they were disrespected or they were wrong. They had views that everyone was following. It was, they were like the Marja al uh, for in theology. Marja al in Shi'i no theology. Bahtis. No Bahtis. And Hussein ibn Ruf was from that family. Uh, we have uh, Hassan ibn Musa no Bakhti who has written the Farag al-Shia, Shia creeds. And other people in al no Bakhti were very... So these people were very credible people. Uh, and also a summary, the, the fourth uh, naib of the Imam. They were very credible. And we see that despite greatest scholars and authors of Shi'i, uh, hadith, Shi'i theology, Shi'i fiqh being present, like Saduq, Rahmatullah alayhi, the father, Saduq the father, Ali ibn Babwe, like Kulayni, Rahmatullah alayhi, they all defer to these four. I mean, you, it's not very easy to appoint someone who is not in, in, in knowledge of hadith or something as uh, at, at the level of Kulayni, for example, and Kulayni deferring to him, accepting, Saduq accepting, it shows that they were quite uh, acceptable, they were quite credible among the Shia scholars. In this way, it was only in this way, and we see that these Nawab had, uh, had opponents, people who were Nawab of the Imam, the, the Nawab of Imam al-Hadi, Imam al-Askari, then they opposed them, say, why you are the Naib, not we? And those people were not small guys, they were big guys as well. But how they actually were defeated, how the scholars accepted the supremacy of these Nawab, it is a fantastic sort of network that we can see was in place to make this to happen. And of course, it was the succor and help of Allah as well. Yeah. And, and we see that how strong this uh, genealogy of the scholars, uh, the uh, you know, uh, the silsile, you know, the chain of the scholars that have reached to us today in terms of these two uh, great scholars such as Sheikh Saduq. You know, his father was the companion of the 11th Imam. He was present there in the presence of the 11th Imam. And his book, Sheikh Saduq's book, is one of the books of, uh, you know, one of the four books that we have. His sons. His uh, sons. Sheikh yes, Saduq's, his son. uh, yeah, meaning uh, his Muhammad father. Muhammad ibn Ali uh, yeah. ibn Babwe. Right. His father, Ali ibn, Muhammad, Ali ibn Babwe. Yes. His son, Sheikh Muhammad Saduq. Is, is yeah. what, both yeah. of them and are Sheikh known Kulaini. as Saduq. Yes. Because they were trusted. Mm -hmm. However, we have Saduq the father, Saduq the son. son. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and Kulaini. As Kulaini as well. As well. So, and then... As you said, few years or about you know hundred years, we have Sheikh Mufid, who we find a tawqi from the Imam yeah. in regards to Sheikh Mufid, and in regards to him getting that title of Mufid as well. Uh, so it really uh, shows us the the authenticity of the Shi'i creed of the Shi'i faith uh, that we have. This was not a matter of imitation. This was not a matter of just hearsay, just people hearing from each other. These scholars were not the scholars who were not familiar with other creeds, other branches of Islam, 
or they didn't know uh, that they cannot follow a child as an imam. I mean, these things, sometimes we think that, okay, he was a child, how, how these people followed him as, a, as an imam, or Imam al uh, Al-Jawad was a child, how the scholars of his time followed him as an imam. These were not uh, uh, small guys. These were not people who followed blindfoldedly or without any reason. They had found the proof for it. We see Sheikh Mufid. You mentioned Sheikh Mufid. Sheikh Mufid lived in a time in Baghdad where, where we had the head of the Mu'tazila, uh, uh, Abu Ali al-Jubba'i. We had the head of the uh, Ash'a'ira al-Baqalani. And we had al-Mufid. And they were matched for each other. I mean, it was not the case that Mufid didn't know about all other faiths. And they had debates, arguments about all these things. And Alhamdulillah, Sheikh Mufid, could somehow lay the foundations of a rational thinking about Shi'i faith, about the 12th Imam, about Imama, in, in a way that no other creed could actually defeat him in debate and argument. And this is, of course, this was a great achievement. Right. And um, in, re in regards to, as you mentioned earlier, the Nobakhtin and their theological thought, and they were well known. I mean, this thought was not something that was in opposition to the thought of the Imamat. You know, no, they were actually uh, somehow uh, uh, corroborating the whole idea right. of Imamat. imamat yeah. now, you, but you know, as in any other creed, Imam was not always accessible. Yes. to go and ask. And even when Imam said something, people had different interpretations of it. So al Nubakh themselves, they, I mean, their contribution to Shi'i faith should not be underestimated. Mm -hmm. And when we say Sheikh Mufid opposed some of their views, it was with all due respect, it was just, it was just a scholarly debate and discussion, not something to, for example, trying to, uh, to diminish their value. What I was actually trying to say is that uh, al Nobach's interpretation of Shi'i faith was prevalent and everyone was following them. And when someone like Hussein ibn Ruh al becomes a wakil or naib of the imam, everyone knows that this is not a, a man to be underestimated in his knowledge, in his uh, trustfulness, in his integrity. That was the man. After the demise of Imam al-Askari after his martyrdom, his uncle Ja'far went to Ahmad ibn Khaqan, who was the chief minister. And all the affairs was actually running under his supervision. And he said that, give this position of Imam to me, and I will give you 20,000 dinar every year. I don't remember now exact number, something like 20,000 dinar every year. Give the position to me. And Ahmad ibn Khawan Khaqan laughed at him. He said that we are giving so much money to the followers of this Imam so that they do not follow him, and they are following him. And of course, uh, the successor. And you want to give me money to convince people to follow you. How foolish you are. And he proved himself foolish about the whole idea of Imam. He thought that it's just a position like a government position, that he could, Ahmad ibn Khaqan could appoint him and people would follow him. And this was the foolishness, of course, of this man. Right. And obviously this was manifested with miracles that people have uh, come and attended to the uh, to the naibs of the imam. And because they started following, uh, as you were saying, that there was a lot of confusion. And they started following Jafar al-Kazzab. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he couldn't really function. Uh, or point out to the karamat which the imam well, actually had. When we say they started, no scholar ever ever followed him. Okay. I mean, we may find some people, some lay yes. people who yeah. were deceived, but as I said, Shi'i scholars were very meticulous about finding out who the imam is. They tested people. They wanted to test their knowledge, their integrity, and even if there was no wasiyah, or wasiyah was confusing, like the time of imam, As-Sadiq the wasiya was confusing because of taqiyah, of course, because he didn't want to mention directly who was the imam. And uh, because of that, uh, the uh, I'm thinking about one instance of a, a person, I'm thinking about his name, 
in Khorasan, I don't remember his name, one of the greatest scholars, Sunni scholars, who when Imam As-Sadiq made that wasiyah that after me, one of the five is, my, is the Imam. The first is Abu Jafar al-Mansur, mm -hmm. the Caliph. Yes. The second is my wife. Yes. The third is uh, the, the, the Wali of Medina. Mm -hmm. the, the fourth, yes. Abdullah al-Aftah. And the fifth, Imam Musab Qazim. When they knew this Vasiya reached him, he said, he laughed and he said that he falsified the claimants and he pointed to the, uh, to, to the Imam by putting, uh, and he concealed the, uh, the, the, the fact so that there is no fear over it. By appointing Al-Mahdi, Abu Jafar al-Mansur, he actually made it uh, impossible for him to kill all the, uh, the, rest of the, four. The, the four. By mentioning his wife, we know that he was not an Amir of, and, and, and by, by mentioning Abdullah and Musa together, we realize that Musa is, this, the, the, is the, 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 the Imam because Abdullah is all older than him and if he was the Imam, he never would have mentioned Musa al-Khazim. In regards to the, um, you know, the, uh, as the presence of the Imam uh, was, uh, Jafar al-Khazab was there and living at the same time of the Imam and many started following lay people, uh, the, uh, the false Imam, Jafar al-Khazab. And the miracles were, uh, or the karamat, was clearly wasn't seen in in in, in Kazab's uh, Jafar Kazab's uh, life, and they come to the realization of the twelfth Imam. Perhaps you could shed, shed some well, light. Well, karamat were not important for our scholars because even false claimants had karamat for themselves. You know, they they were they had great mystical sort of value. Yes, of course, the Nawab had karamat, but this was not the, the reason why they followed the Imam. It was the, 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 the clear indication in narrations, the clear rational proof that the Nawab had, and also what they had heard from Imam al-Askari salam That was the reason they followed. And uh, therefore, it makes the whole the process a very rational, uh, a very uh, uh, understandable process of believing and following and affiliating themselves to the Imam. The commonality or the, if we compare the Imam or the titles, for example, uh, we find uh, for Imam Hussein, in Al Hussein Misbah Al Huzawa Safina Tamila. And when we examine the titles of the other Imams, we find that the twelfth Imam is also regarded as the Safina Nija. You know, there's a commonality between Imam Hussein and the twelfth Imam in regards to the Qiyam, you know, in regards to the Ashab and the supporters of the Imam. Uh, so uh, there are many other sort of commonalities that we could perhaps see. Uh, are there any other um, titles that we could really perhaps uh, discuss, uh, Hajjaka, in regards well, to? Well, all the Imams, I mean, some of the Imams uh, were somehow given a title which uh, presented the most apparent aspects of their, uh, uh, their activity, like, for example, Imam al-Baqir, because he was, um, uh, he was introducing the Shi'i faith and theology and knowledge, he was called Baqir. Not that other A'imma were not Baqir, Baqir al-Ail. Or Imam al-Sadiq, he was uh, dubbed as Sadiq because, of course, there were other claimants as well, and he was called, but not that other A'imma were not Sadiq. Now, with regards to Imam al-Hujjah, yes, of course, he's Safinat al-Nijat. And in Dua Shaban, uh, in Salawat of Shaban, we, what we say, Allahumma salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, al-fulk al-jariya fil-lujaj al These are the running arcs, Safina, in deep oceans. And when we think about it, it is absolutely true. We are in deep ocean of confusion. We don't know what path we have to follow. We are like people who are drowning in a, an ocean of 
misunderstanding, confusion, uh, mundanity, going towards mundane things, and all these things. And we are looking just for a ship to come and rescue us. And these are the rescuers, of course. Imam al-Mahdi, especially in our time, these are the rescuers. When this ship comes, we just hold our hands up, please, please help us. Let us come up. Now, some people don't want to board on this ship. That's a different matter. But al-fulk al-jariya fil lujaj al-ghamara ya'manu man rakibaha wa yakhraqu man taraka. Whoever rides on this, boards on this ship, of course, is secured. Whoever uh, leaves it will be drowned. So, Yes, of course, he is Safina to Nijad, as all our other Ayyam are Safina to Nijad. But the point about Imam Hussein a.s. and Imam al-Mahdi a.s. is that Imam Hussein, in a way, uh, uh, showed the way he was Masbah al-Huda in a very confusing situation for Muslims. that They, they didn't know uh, the, the whole concept of Khilafah and who is the, should be the Caliph of the Prophet, how a Caliph of the Prophet or a ruler of Muslims should behave, that was. And in case of Imam al-Mahdi salam, of course, we are living in a time that we need a Hujjah. One of the uh, main titles of uh, Imam al-As is Hujjah. Hujjah, Hujjah yeah. is a very important title. Uh, you know, uh, when we call someone Rasulullah, Allah is here. Allah is now here with us, isn't it? Uh, when Rasul is someone who sent from one person to another person, from one place to another per place. Now, why we need a Rasul between us and God? Why should we need a Rasul while Allah is present, while we can believe in Him? Now, the reason is that He is so sublime that our thoughts, our minds, our hearts, cannot reach to receive that guidance from him. So he chooses someone, Allahu yajtabi min al malaikat rusulan wa min al nas. Allah chooses from among the angels, rusul, and from the people, and gives that knowledge to that one person, and sends him to us, in a sense that, not sending in terms of space, sending in terms of uh, levels of, Connection. We don't have that level of connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he sends it to us. We follow him. Now, the hujja is a similar concept. We need someone to be the proof for us that this is the right way of following Islam. This is the right way of behaving. This is the right way that if we, on the day of judgment we say to Allah that subhanahu wa ta'ala that, that we follow this man, we followed the 12th Imam, we followed any Imam or the Prophet, then Allah says, okay, you have a hujja over me. You followed him. Of course, you may have misunderstandings. And if we say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we didn't know what to do, we didn't know how to behave, we didn't know how to understand the Quran, Allah says that I had someone there for you to go and ask. And that is hujja of Allah. So, the Imam is hujjatullah in two ways. One is he is hujjah for Allah. If we claim on the day of judgment that we didn't know, we didn't have a guide, Allah says, this is the guide, I have a proof against you. And if we follow the Imam and then on the day of judgment, Allah asks us why you did behave in this, we say, this, we follow this pe these people and this is our hujjah. So, a hujja between Allah and man is a very important concept and is seminal she thought. And we have many narrations from Ayyam al al-Hujja If there was not a hujja, there was no point for living. Allah had not completed his, 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 his religion. Allah had not put a guide, a connection between him and the people. And of course, the, the earth would have swallowed the people because there was no point in uh, in existence. So the hujja is very important. He is the hujja of the time, hujja of our time. Although we do not have access to him, but the fact that we do not have access to him is because of us, not of him. Because of us, not personally, because of the human beings in general, because of Muslims in general. There were other ayyamah, they imprisoned them, they killed them. So Allah withdrew this hujja. Now, Allah withdrew because of his safety, because people would have killed him, because would have imprisoned him. Now, so 
whose fault is his disappearance? Allah's fault, his fault, or people's fault? It's people's fault. So if he's not amongst us, it is our fault. As I said, not personally, not, not individually, as a whole human race that Allah should send the hujjah for them. And uh, therefore we have to really pray that Allah would somehow help and return this hujjah to amongst us. Now, I, I mean, I was going to look into the other aspects of the verse of the Qur'an, بَقِيَتَ اللَّهُ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ But you have basically guided us towards the signs of his reappearance, you know, his return. Uh, it's quite, uh, quite mind-boggling, quite uh, unique and special, and especially it comes very uh, handy, so to speak, in regards to for us to prepare uh, with the Imam. Uh, and many rivayat and traditions have been mentioned. Uh, just to read a few, for example, uh, which they say the revolt of Sufiani. That's number one, very famous sign that it was going to happen before. Uh, the counter revolt of the Yemeni Yemenites, um, uh, basically, and then the cry. Yamani. Uh, Yamani, yeah, 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 the, the Yamani. The cry, say. Uh, Yamani, and then you have the, uh, uh, the Nida, you know, that cry that will happen. The fourth is the Qatl of Nafsu Zakiya, the killing of the pure soul, the assassination of the pure soul. Sometimes indicated between Maqam Ibrahim and Mecca. Um, and then the swallowing of the army, uh, Jaish, Kashful Jaish, uh, swallowing of the army, um, which is composed of the adversaries of Imam Mahdi, salam, will be swallowed up by the earth. So, I mean, these are certain four, four to five signs, famous ones, obviously, there are other signs as well which are pointed out to, but usually these are the um, been brought in public or discussed or everybody kind of is aware of uh, as you started talking about the reappearance so perhaps we could look into that Shahajang, a little bit well these five are of course the most important ones some of them are the signs and some of them are things which happen just before or during his advent we know that Imam Ali Salam has a Zuhur and a Khuruj Zuhur is when he actually summons his 313 uh, aides, the people who will help him in propagating the, uh, the reappearance that Imam has now come. And this, of course, may be by the cry. That the Sayers comes, everyone hears that in their own language. We don't know how this happens and what is that, what's the nature of it, that Imam has reappeared, has returned, but he is not yet out for people to reach him, uh, to access him, because he is still uh, in hiding. Although his return is now has now started, but he is still in hiding. And those 330 that we have heard about, these are the purest of the pure of the Ummah. Purest of the pure of the Ummah in terms of uh, their actual, the, the, the absolute reliance on Allah, their absolute trust, their un, inadulterated faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, if you want to, be, to become uh, one of those 313, of course, this is very ambitious to say, but it, the whole complete, the heart should be completely empty of dunya. Because when Imam comes, he doesn't fight for dunya. The heart should be completely empty of the and filled with faith and love of Allah. These are the 330. And we know that these are from different parts of the world. And 50 of them we have, as we have in Nigeria, they are, are women. And it's very interesting that why Imam needs women to actually be part of his aids. These are, in a way, he's, he's going to send these people to different parts of the world announcing the reappearance of the Imam arguing and debating with people about the faith, convincing people about the true faith, the deenullah, and then of course that Imam is the leader of this faith. So this should be absolutely pure people, absolutely well expressed people, the people who can express themselves very nicely. And they go from Europe, they go from Asia, they go from Africa, they are 
scattered and they go and they are led to that hiding place of the Imam. And Imam gives them the, the authority to go and talk to people that he has, he is back. Now, this is the Zuhur. Imam has not come out yet. There is no Khuruj yet. Zuhur is this interim period when the, the, these deputies, so to speak, that we had four deputies for the Imam in Ghaybatul Sughra, we have 313 in Ghaybatul Kubra that they go around and talk about the Imam. This actually creates some sort of agitation in the world, especially among the Muslims, and especially we have in Mecca, in Medina, opposition, strong opposition against the Imam and against these people. Those who believe in the Imam are being persecuted and killed. And especially in Medina, many of the followers of the Imam, those who believe in these 213 and want to follow, uh, they are rounded up and they are killed. And everyone who wants to say that I want to believe would be in danger, it's on that time that Imam advances and comes out and make forms an army to go and fight to free the, uh, the people from the persecution in Medina. And then we have Sufyani coming from the other side with a huge, with a huge army. And uh, 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 what we have, the numbers we have in, uh, in, in narrations reaches to millions of people coming in his army. There is no way for the Imam who could defeat this army because Imam has a small army and these people are equipped with the the most modern weaponry, the most modern, uh, sophisticated software and hardware and everything. And it is the miracle of Allah when they come close to uh, Medina and Mecca, then in Bayda, the earth swallows them. That's the khasw of al -Bayda. So it's not a sign of reappearance, it's one of the things which happens during their reappearance. However, these, I don't think we need to be concerned about these things because these will happen in future. What we have to be concerned about is our position when Imam arrives and when those 313 people go around the world call people to the Imam and when especially he himself comes out. We have to be concerned about ourselves, whether we will follow or we will reject. Because when we do not uh, find an idea pleasant to our heart. It's not in our hands, we reject it. Now when the Imam comes and says things that are not uh, in conformity with what I already believe or values that I have already uh, uh, quite become strong in and uh, emphatic about, then I'm certainly going to know this is not the Imam. Just like, for example, we say that uh, the Jews rejected Messiah because he was not what they thought to be the Messiah. He was not someone who would fulfill the ambitions that they had about Messiah. So why uh, we believe that uh, uh, Messiah was rejected by the Jews? Uh, of course, they did not believe that he was the Messiah. That's their belief. And we, we are not concerned about that belief, we don't want to discuss that. But why we believe that it was rejected is because the uh, ambitions that they were having in their mind about Messiah were not fulfilled. Now, what if, for example, the Imam salam comes and we have some ambitions and some superstitions, some ideas about when he comes, he does this, and, and we see he doesn't do any of those things. And he does exactly the opposite of those things. Then we say, no, this is not the one we were expecting. This is not the one we were waiting for. So it's very important that we work on ourselves rather than being concerned about the signs and such things. And how we can create that situation in which when Imam talks, our heart approves of, is by bringing ourselves closer to, the, closer to the values that the Imam is going to bring. There's one very interesting khutbah in Nahjul Balaga when he talks about Imam al-Mahdi, the Imam alayhi salam talks about Imam al-Mahdi. As, as you said, even since the early time of our Imams, 
from the time of Imam Ali السلام, from the time of the Prophet, they knew that there will be someone who will come and would fill the earth with justice. He is the Mahdi and all the A'imma were waiting for him as well. One might think that, well, weren't they Imam as well? Why they were waiting for him? Because they are not allowed, they, are not, they have not been given permission or support the way Imam al-Mahdi is given. So they were waiting for him to come, to fill the earth with justice. Now what we can do, this khutbah says, when Imam alayhi salam comes, يَعْتِفُ الْحَوَى عَلَى الْهُدَى إِذَا عَتَفُ الْهُدَى عَلَى الْحَوَى وَيَعْتِفُ الْرَأْيَى عَلَى الْقُرْآنِ إِذَا عَتَفُ الْقُرْآنَ عَلَى الْرَأْيِ He brings back, back all whimsy desires of people back to guidance. And desires are what? We have actually interpreted the guidance in a way that it's actually uh, conforms with our desires. And he brings back all the opinions that people have made about the ayat of the Qur'an back to the Qur'an after people have made the Qur'an subservient to their ideas and opinions. Now, how we can actually prepare ourselves is to ponder on the Qur'an, reflect, in his, uh, on his ayat, try to absorb the values of the Qur'an, because that's the value which is important. There's one hadith from the Prophet, peace be upon him, when he said to his companions, how would you do when a time comes when your, 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 your women go immodest and your youth your, go corrupt and you do not do amr bil ma'roof and nahi anil munkar? The companion said, Ya Rasulullah, would such a time come? He said, yes, and worse than that will come. And I said, what's worse than that? He said, worse than that is that when the women go immodest, the youth go corrupt, and you do amr bil munkar wa nahi anil ma'ruf. You do the opposite. They said, Ya Rasulullah, would such a time come? He said, yes, and worse than that. And they said, what's worse than that? He said, when a time comes, إِذَا رَأَيْتُمُ الْمَعْرُوفَ مُنْكَرَ وَالْمُنْكَرَ مَعْرُوفَ You see the good as evil and see evil as good. Change of values. You see, this, this is what we are now experiencing, isn't it? This shift of values, shift of uh, the, the value system of the whole human race, which is affecting everyone and even the Muslim world. This shift of values is coming. And this is, this is probably the sign of the reappearance of the Imam Ali Salam. And when he comes, he returns all this back to the Quran. We see many people in the Muslim world, they are trying to justify these values by reinterpreting certain verses of the Quran. Is this a correct method? Can we do that? Well, you can say, okay, let's close the Quran and put it aside. This book is not for us, not for our time. Let's follow modern values. We can do that and we go out of Islam, okay? But saying that, no, we want to remain as a Muslim and we want to reinterpret the Quran to go with these values, then that is exactly an instance of man fassara al-Qur'ana bi-ra'yih fal yatabawwa maqadahu min al This is a mutawatir hadith from the Prophet. Whoever interprets the Quran by his own opinionated view, then should take a seat in the hell. Well, thank you very much, Hajjah. Wonderful. Uh, we wish we could continue, you know, uh, uh, but apparently we are uh, at the closure of the program and we would really request you uh, uh, on live, uh, you know, in front of everybody that we would like to have your presence more, inshallah, uh, in our studio here. Um, thank you very much to all our viewers for joining us. Indeed, uh, a very important point uh, with, uh, which Hajara mentioned uh, is in regards to whether, um, uh, whether I am and my responsibilities, uh, uh, whether I am prepared, you know, what I'm doing in terms of my sincerity, my acts. Uh, if, if, if the way, same way that I know uh, what I'm saying and what I'm doing, and the amount of sincerity that is in there, the Imam is fully aware of that sincerity. Uh, and will I going to be committing the same act and the same speech and the same intentions 
um, when it comes to work, when it comes to with the family, uh, that where I always try to see my ego and my desire to be saved. Um, and then I work according to that. So uh, is this what uh, this is this how am I really preparing for the reappearance of the Imam where he's already fully aware of it? Am I going to be uh, one of those 313? Uh, do, do I see myself to be one of those 313? Well, these are the things that uh, we really need to work on uh, with your du'as and the du'as of Asati, our teachers. Inshallah, we will try to uh, prepare the reappearance of our 12th Imam. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you again. Thank you very much, Ajah.